Hi, I'm Sabin Yaakov. This presentation is entitled Capacitor Precharge Circuits and Answer to a Riddle, which I've posted earlier. Please note that at the end there is a discussion on sizing and thermal consideration of charging resistor, that is the resistor which is used for charging. So uh, you better stick to the end or at least jump to the end because it's, I think, interesting and important. So we are concerned here with the pre-charge circuit, which is required in order to avoid high inrush current. If you just connect the voltage to a capacitor, you're going to have a very high peak current, which is, could be dangerous. So you need a pre-charge to charge the capacitor in a lower current and then you once the capacitor is charged you turn on the main switch or conductor and here we have then the path to the output from the input to the output uh, after it's being charged the capacitor so the questions of this riddle were related to four charging circuits here are three one is a simple resistor charging scheme in which you have a resistor which is limiting the current and then you turn on after the capacitor is charged you turn on the main switch here number two we have a transistor the zener keeps the voltage here 12 volt the threshold is only five so transistor is conducting and then you have charging through this path and once the capacitor is charged you turn on the main switch and then we have another configuration also with the transistor but with the resistor here at the source of the transistor again we have 12 volt here threshold is 5 volt and there is a charging through here and then eventually we turn on the main switch and finally we have a fourth scheme in which we have a switch mode converter which is charging uh, the capacitor and then this could be either from the high voltage or from an auxiliary uh, power supply and then once the capacitor is charged uh, we turn on the main switch so the questions of this riddle were as follows to order the pre-charge schemes with regard to efficiency that is lower losses first and then the other one what makes the highest rank that is the one with the lowest losses efficient which of the schemes will have the highest peak current and to estimate the maximum current of scheme number one which is this one with this simple transistor and uh, which is turned on uh, by this switch and then um, current is flowing through the transistor so these were the questions and here are my answers to them let's start with a simple case of a resistor charging a capacitor now we know there is a loss of energy let me redo it here in a simple way if we have a amount of delta q coming out of the source then the energy coming out of the source is delta q over the voltage and delta q is the charge stored in the capacitor c times v1 so therefore the input energy here from the source uh, by replacing this here we find it to be cv1 square as a whole this is the input energy to the system on the other hand we know that the energy stored in a capacitor is cv square over 2 so we see that half of the energy coming out of the source got lost where to the resistor notice that this calculation did not take into account any number for the resistance that is uh, it's a general truth here and it's kind of uh, strange because you would assume that somehow the resistance here will affect the losses well you can do it in a parallel analysis in another way and this way will be to take the i squared times rs as the power loss of the resistor now notice that if rs is large the current will be small because it's a large resistor if rs is small the current will be large proportionally and it turns out that when you take this integral for these two cases this integral comes to be independent of rs it's 
interesting and it's kind of amazing I think it's like a like one of those uh, laws of nature so we understand now that all these schemes here and here which is sort of a resistor and here will consume the same power or same energy when charging the capacitor so they all have the same loss now what about the DC to DC converter well we know that the efficiency of DC to DC converter could be very high but why because we know that in DC to DC converter there is no link between the resistance of the switches and say the inductor and the RMS in fact what is controlling the RMS current or the value of the RMS currents is the inductor so you can choose an inductor that will lower the RMS and then also independently you can reduce the resistance of the system without affecting the RMS current so there is no linkage here and therefore you can optimize the system to have a high efficiency low RMS and low resistance so this is the reason why this scheme indeed will be uh, the best one in terms of losses that is will be the lowest uh, loss among the all other options so what about the peak current okay here the peak will be the voltage over RS when the voltage here is zero which is 1.4 volt here it's going to be dependent on the RS this is like a current source because once we have a voltage here then we have a about a threshold voltage between gate and source above it somewhat and the rest is on this resistor so it makes this circuit to be a constant current so since this is 12 volt and the threshold here is 5 volt we have 7 volt so it's 7 over 50 ohms it's 140 million this is going to be a fairly constant current here we're going to have a high peak this is the peak and then we'll taper off exponentially now what about number two the case of the uh, MOSFET uh, transistor now you would think that uh, it is a function of the RDS on in fact uh, if you have 70 volt in 5 uh, milli ohm then it comes up to be 14 kilo amp well that's too much and that's not the case the point is that RDS on is the slope here at very low voltages and low current relatively so in this region here of the I as a function of VDS and this is the gate voltage here is the RDS on however if you move to higher current you get to the region in which the MOSFET behaves like a current source so if for example we are at um, say uh, this is 10 this for this particular transistor of course uh, so this will be 10 volt this will be like uh, here 70 volt or something like that you see that it is tapering off and it's not more than uh, I don't know 20 amp in this particular transistor obviously each transistor will have its own behavior now you can improve somewhat this uh, scheme by adding a large capacitor this will be like several microfarads or tens of microfarad but again you have to be very careful because the band in which uh, the transistor is starting to, con to conduct is very narrow it like start from the threshold to a couple of volt above it so it's a short time and the current could be very high and you have to be extremely careful not to exceed the safe operating area the SOA here is for example for a given transistor we have the limits that are imposed so not to harm the transistor for example if the pulse or duration of the current is 10 millisecond this is the limit here so for this particular transistor uh, say 70 volt you can sustain only something like uh, 2 3 amp if you go for 10 millisecond if the timing is much longer then it's sort of approaching the DC 
and you are getting uh, to this point. So one has to be extremely careful not to exceed uh, these limits. Now, normally, if you sort of exceed it once, nothing will happen. But if you repeatedly re exceed the limits, then it will harm the transistor. Eventually, it will fail. So this is now the question of the peak current. We can now answer all the questions. The order of the various uh, configuration with regard to efficiency is obviously four which is this has the highest efficiency, all the others have the same, same efficiency. Then what makes the highest rank, the one with the lowest loss uh, efficient? Well, we understand it's the inductor, which lowers the RMS current, while you can independently lower the resistance. Then which of the schemes will have the highest P current? Probably two, probably two, although it depends on the curve ID as a function of VDS. And again, we cannot estimate the uh, peak current here unless we look up the data sheet and see exactly what's the uh, behavior of the particular transistor we are using. So let me now turn to another issue which is related to what we are talking about, which is very important. And that is how do you size this resistor? Now this resistor operates for a short time. So it's not a steady state situation. And therefore the consideration here are a little bit different. You have to consider a power pulse condition. So what happens in this case is that the energy that you pump in uh, by this current and uh, this, that is dissipates here, doesn't have a chance to move away by convection or radiation, most of it is trapped here within the unit itself and it's heating it up. So you have a stored energy and the amount of energy in our case is the CV square over two. Okay, so how can you deal with it? A very simple model for it, which I suggest here, is the following. You have a mass, this is the resistor, which you pump in energy and then the temperature will go up. Now the parameter related to this uh, process is the specific heat capacity of the material, which is defined in terms of joule per degree centigrade per kilogram. In this case, we are looking for the mass in kilogram. So from this and knowing the energy you put in and defining the delta T you allow, you can actually calculate the mass that you need in order to store the energy, not to exceed this delta T. So let's take an example now. Here we have a case in which we have here 70 volt, a capacitor which is three millifarad, say, and therefore the energy that we have to handle is seven joule, approximately. Now if we assume that the specific heat capacity is 1000 joule per centigrade per kilogram. This is by the way for concrete and the material usually will be ceramic, which is sort of like that. And we assume that we allow a increase of 50 degrees centigrade. Then we find that for this particular case, we need a mass of 0.14 gram. So we need quite a bit of mass in order to store the amount of energy that is uh, dissipated during this process, not to exceed the 50 degree. By the way, in this case, 50 ohm and three millifarad, it has a time concept of 150 milliseconds. So the duration will be like say three, it's about one second until the whole thing ends up. And so it's a quite a bit of a duration here. So let's look now at commercial power resistors. And here's one example from Vichy. It's a discrete uh, wire wound resistor. Here it is. And let's look, look at this particular model, this type. And you see the mass is half a gram. Now this includes the wires here and the cap, which may not be uh, storing uh, the heat. So let's say that the net here 
uh, weight is say 0.3 or something like that, it's just an approximation. Okay, so this is this uh, unit here. And by the way, the size of this unit is 11 millimeter long and uh, four millimeter approximately diameter. So here is what the vendor is giving, although it's given in a kind of a funny way, this curve here, which is given, is in what second per ohm? What second is joule per ohm? I don't know why is it per ohm, but that's the way they gave it. So, uh, yes. for example, if you have uh, 10 ohms, this is ohms now, you hit this point, you got this value, then you have to multiply it by 10. So I did it. So this is now energy. It's not, this is what second, what's second, that is joules, period. So for 50 ohm, which is about here, about here, we are talking about two joules. Okay, which is kind of close to what we said. Notice that this curve goes down. That is the larger the resistance, the less energy you can pump in. And the reason is that when the resistance is low, you have heavy wires and few of them, and they are, set, uh, they are at a distance from one to the other. So they, sort of there is a cooling effect here. So if it is one ohm, you can have uh, like, uh, I don't know, seven uh, joules. While if it is um, thousand ohm, there'd the be very fine wire uh, close together, so the heat cannot uh, dissipate or cannot uh, move out or move into the unit and therefore it will get very hot and therefore this curve goes down a little bit. So this is the situation with this particular resistor. Now there are some SMT type power resistors and then have a look at this type 2512 it's not that tiny, it's six millimeter long, three wide and 0.8 height. Now remember that this is now sitting on a copper, which is sort of helping to remove the heat. And if I look at this particular one, then it weighs 55, this is milligrams, so it's 0.055 grams. So it's like uh, one third of the value that I have uh, estimated. And so this is an SMT unit. And let's see now the performance here for a pulse, for a single pulse. Again, it's given in, in watts, uh, which is kind of irrelevant. So I've converted it to joules. So this is joule now. And so this is one joule, this is 10 joule. And this is now the pulse duration. So if we talk about the pulse duration between say 100 to a thousand millivolt we are here and this is the unit I was talking about so we can see that this particular unit again this is the curve that I have uh, recalculated from the watts into joules and this unit here now for say one second can absorb up to say 10 joules also interesting that the longer the time, the more joule it can absorb. And, and the reason is that the more time, there's more chance for dissipation to take over. But again, you see that uh, we are in the ballpark of the very, very rough calculation I did, which shows that indeed the mass of the element is very important in handling a single pulse, high current single pulse. So this brings me to the end of this uh, presentation. I hope you found it of interest and perhaps it will be useful to you in the future. Thank you very much.